Before you work on this particular topic, I'd like you to know exactly what I expect of you and the things to do as you go through it. Listen to the audio uh, as you go through it and make notes on slides three to nine. Don't just look at the bullet points. They don't tell you enough. There's more detail in the audio. Then go to slide 10 and 11. You'll find the slide numbers at the bottom right hand corner. On slide 10 and 11, you'll find Clusus's views. You'll find Paul Zanker and Alison Cooley, uh, both of whom are experts in their field on Augustus. Put those Clusus's views about the mausoleum of Augustus into your own words, please. Then go to slide 12. Watch the video and make notes. It's a Masalit video. If you have lost your username and password, you need to get in touch with the study centre staff. And it's Amanda Hartley Newton you need to get in touch with, A-N-H. I do expect at least half a side of A4 on that, please. And then use this PowerPoint and page 186 to 187 of the textbook and the video that you have watched on the Mausoleum of Augustus and go to slide 13 and answer the questions. I really want this to be done on a Word document and I want the Word document uploaded to MS Teams. Thanks. I'm sure you'll remember the background history to why Octavian actually built the mausoleum. In 32 BC, Antony had decided to give away part of the Roman Empire to Egypt in the Alexandrian donations and he'd celebrated a triumph for the Armenian campaign in Egypt with Cleopatra. Antony dressed as Osiris, the Egyptian god, and Cleopatra dressed as Isis. So in 32 BC, uh, Antony uh, was effectively um, celebrating Roman triumphs with Roman armies in, uh, in Egypt. Um, and then he'd given away part of the Roman Empire, as I say, in the Alexandrian donations to the Egyptian queen. He had reasons for doing that. That was the same year, if you remember rightly, that Octavian then stole Antony's will from the Temple of the Vestal Virgins and he read it to the Senate. And in Antony's will, Antony stated that he wanted to be buried in, alongside Cleopatra in Alexandria in Egypt. And then that was seen as disloyalty to Rome. Octavian then began his work on his mausoleum in 32 BC when he was 30 years old. If Mark Antony was going to be buried in Egypt, Octavian in 32 BC wanted to demonstrate that uh, he was loyal to Rome. And so if Antony was going to be buried in Egypt, Octavian wanted a mausoleum in Rome. Octavian was simply reinforcing to the Senate that he was a dedicated Roman, unlike uh, Mark Antony. Octavian has a large building programme set, uh, set around something called the Campus Marcius. That is the old parade ground in uh, ancient Rome. That idea that um, he is building buildings of peace um, in an area where there was once war. The Campus Marcius was, used to be the old Roman parade ground where soldiers would march around. And now he was associating it with the Arapakis, the altar of peace and the mausoleum of Augustus. They are roughly in the same place. So the building you can see on this slide is actually the mausoleum of Halicarnassus and it's what Augustus bases his mausoleum on. It was one of the wonders of the ancient world and it'd been built by Morsalus, who was a satrap, a provincial governor from the first Persian Empire uh, in the fourth century BC. It was a very well known building and an absolutely massive building, uh, but most buildings of the second triumviral period were uh, well known um, and were massive. The second triumviral period is that period when Octavian, Mark Antony and Lepidus are influential. We know then that Augustus was basing his mausoleum on the mausoleum of um, Morsalus in Halicarnassus, one of the wonders of the ancient world. 
So it's certainly a, a Hellenistic influence on uh, the mausoleum of Augustus. Um, and there's various reasons for that. Um, what then is Hellenistic influence? Well, after the death of Alexander the Great uh, in 323 BC, uh, Alexander's empire was actually split into three. And from 323 BC to the Battle of Actium in 31 BC is actually called the Hellenistic period. Uh, his successors in Egypt, the Middle East and in Greece um, are called Hellenistic kings. They are meant to be Alexander's successors. So that 300 year period up to Actium, the Hellenistic period, uh, people in those countries were seen as Alexander's heirs. And they built Hellenistic monuments. So these large funerary monuments were built uh, throughout the empire in the Hellenistic style. And the Muslim of Halad Karnassus in uh, Turkey, uh, in the first Persian Empire, was one of those examples of a Hellenistic tomb. They are meant for the heirs of Alexander the Great. But the real tomb of Alexander was in fact in Alexandria, Egypt, where Mark Antony was to be buried. Mark Antony then was to be buried where Alexander was buried. So Augustus has got to kind of go one better in a sense. And so he builds his own mausoleum in the style of a Hellenistic king, one of the wonders of the ancient world, this uh, mausoleum um, that he, he builds is meant to be direct confrontation with Mark Antony in Egypt. And if Mark Antony was to be buried in Egypt in a pyramid, Augustus was to be buried in Rome in a round building. All of this is uh, Octavian Augustus trying to better Mark Antony uh, simply by uh, where he has got his mausoleum located, the influence of the mausoleum, and he's simply saying, I'm just as good as Mark Antony. I am like one of these Hellenistic kings uh, that were the direct ancestors to Alexander the Great. There's a video coming up, but let's give you some brief details of the mausoleum. This is the mausoleum of Augustus. It is round. It's 42 meters high um, and a bronze statue of Augustus stood on the top, shining like a beacon. That is now lost. Marcellus, the husband of Julia, was the first to be buried inside in 23 BC. Virgil mentions the funeral in Book 6 of the Aeneid. And it was built on the Campus Martius, Mars Field, that is an old parade ground. So its very existence symbolised the idea that Augustus was bringing peace to Rome. We've talked a little bit about this before, but this is a better map of the Campus Martius, so you can actually see what is there. The mausoleum of Augustus itself was surrounded by public parks and other buildings. Um, you can see that the mausoleum uh, is very close to the horologium, which is the sundial of Augustus that was excavated by Mussolini in the 1930s. You'll notice next to the horologium, that sundial, was the Arapakis as well. The mausoleum of Augustus and the Arapakis are therefore in a straight line. Directly opposite, uh, across the road, as it were, at the very top right hand corner, hopefully you can see there the gardens of Lucullus. And then uh, not too far away are the Campus Martius, the old uh, parade ground, the old Mars field. You've got the bats, the pool and the grove of Agrippa, the pantheon of Agrippa, that round building. Um, you've got the Scepter Julia, the voting hall, a reminder that it, you only vote because it is the uh, you are blessed to do so by the Julian clan. Uh, the Theatre of Pompey, uh, the Amphitheatre, the Theatre of Balbus, the Porticus of Octavia, the Theatre of Marcellus. Notice the parkland. 
Uh, parklands often give the impression of a classical Greek temple because sanctuaries in Greece were surrounded by parks. Um, but also notice how many public buildings are here, not just uh, parklands, but you've got uh, baths, you've got theatres, you've got amphitheatres, all of which would have been enjoyed by the public and made Augustus much, much more popular. Also, you notice the names of these buildings. They are named after various members of his family, his sister, the portico of Octavia, the theatre of Marcellus, um, the grove and the baths of Agrippa, the villa of Agrippa just directly opposite. It's amazing to think that um, Agrippa and Augustus themselves live very, very, very close to these very central buildings. And just in case you hadn't noticed, and it's almost tiny, you could almost miss it. But if you look at the very bottom right hand corner of this map, you can see the capital, which is the center of political life. But notice what you are actually focusing on here is the enjoyment of the public. And that enjoyment of the public generally tends to be associated with members of his own family. We talked in the previous slide about the location of some of the buildings on the actual campus Marcius, but the map that you've actually got here widens it out ever so slightly. So uh, what you can hopefully see there, if you have a look to the left hand side in one of the bends of the river, you'll actually see the campus Marcius there just underneath Pompey's gardens with Pompey's theatres. That was where the Arapakis was, and that was where the Campus Marcius was. Um, the buildings close to the mausoleum, we've talked about that before, the Arapakis, the Sundial, the Horologium, the Pantheon of Agrippa, the Theatre of Marcellus, they were all there on the Campus Marcius. But let's just widen this out a bit to some of the buildings that we've already talked about. At the bottom right hand corner on the previous map, you actually saw the Capitol building. Uh, the Capitol building was uh, the place, the centre really of political life. Capitoline Hill, the capital uh, in America is still obviously very important. And on that you've got the Temple of Jupiter, which is where the um, the um, they would originally have had those standards brought back from Parthia. Hopefully you can see just below there, you can see Julius Caesar's uh, marketplace with the Temple of Saturn, the Basilica Julia, the Temple of Castrum Pollux, which was built for, um, th that was built for the Equites, those middle class um, people. And then right there uh, in the centre, really, of the Forum, you've got the Palatine Hill on which Augustus's palace would be located, and more of that later. But Augustus had a problem. If you remember rightly, the, he had planned for this during the period of 32 BC, when he was basically trying to show off, trying to show off that he was bigger and better than Mark Antony, so he builds a, uh, a building based on the biggest and the best wonder of the ancient world, uh, the mausoleum of Halicarnassus. But as his uh, time in office went on, um, Augustus had to try and move away from that rather confrontational image. Um, and so that idea of bigger and better, uh, he really needed to think about um, the impression that that was trying to give. He was more interested as he grew older in showing that he was constitutionally elected, um, being a man of the people, and also associating himself with peace than showing off that he was bigger and better than everybody else. One of the topics that I've assigned you today is to put these classicist views into your own words. So here is classicist view number one by Paul Zanker. The monument was first of all a demonstration of its patron's great power. The name Mausoleum, which it bore from the very beginning, was thus totally justified. The term embodies a sense of marvel at the sheer size, 
which far overshadowed all earlier such structures in Rome and could only be likened to the tomb of the Carian dynast Morsulus, one of the seven wonders of the world, Paul Zanker. And here's Alison Cooley from Warwick University, just down the road. She says this, the mausoleum of Augustus was completed in 28 BC, several decades before his death. Given its size and complexity, work on the monument must have begun some years earlier, perhaps in 32 BC, with the tomb playing an important role in the final propaganda battle against Antony, leading up to the naval battle at Actium in 31 BC. By building such a massive tomb for himself at Rome, the young Caesar was eager to highlight the contrast between himself and Antony. The primary purpose of the mausoleum was to contrast Octavian's Romanness with Antony's Eastern affectations. And here's a video to watch. I need you to watch this particular one rather than just any video about the Augustan mausoleum, because this is by Matthew Nittles, Professor Natalie Nittles of the University of Reading. You're going to need a massively username and password to watch this video. If you have lost yours, please email anh.ssfc.ac.uk. That's Amanda Hartley Newton, the Study Centre Manager. And here are some questions for you to answer. Please don't forget, don't just use the audio within this PowerPoint. You'll also find some very detailed information on page 186 and 187 of your textbook, and you can use the video as well. You could also do maybe a little bit of research around the internet if you want to. So question A, what impression of himself did Augustus want to give building the mausoleum of Augustus? Question B, explain why a Hellenistic style mausoleum might have been problematic for Augustus's image. And then C, why was the mausoleum of Augustus set in acres of parkland?